Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. J. Dyer of Jay's Analysis. Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. 
today's analysis. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. You're listening to Jay Dyer. Let's make sure we have good audio. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hmm. Are we having... All right, good. I can be heard. There we go. Yes, we're going to talk to True Dilton for the hundredth time. I've had endless requests. So, yeah, we'll talk to him. And I messaged him today and he said, yeah, we'll do it. We'll do a talk. Oh, oh, philosophy. <laughs> Oh, these questions. Anyway, so I thought in the wake of the um, many recent discussions and debates, it would be pertinent to have a stream that dealt with objections and questions because naturally debates, they just lead to a whole lot of questioning, which is a good thing. That's a good thing. So the, the topics today, we're going to specifically stick, try to stick to, you know, philosophy, metaphysics, the branches of philosophy and defending them. Uh, but we're not just going to stay. I mean, if you want to ask theological questions, that's fine, because anytime I talk about philosophy, everybody comes in, they want to talk about uh, uh, theology. Anytime I talk about theology, everybody comes in, they want to talk about conspiracy and some other topics. So, you know, I understand they're not disconnected but please let's stay on on the topic roughly and let's talk first about this this uh issue of cucks into the shadows what are you talking about matt by the way yeah if somebody wants to come on and debate matt do you want to come on and debate since you're calling me a cuck uh, i tried to give the debate platform openly today we had open Open debate day at Jay's analysis. Uh, yeah, I don't really care what Ask Yourself did in terms of his video. Ask Yourself is a, a childish guy. Um, he needs to grow up a lot a bit, a, a lot before we have any more interaction. I'm not interested in having more, any more interactions with that guy. That's that's low IQ Spurg level stuff. So um, not going to waste my time debating. 20 year olds. Although if this Matt character wants to come on, he's, if he calls me a cuck, he can, he can come on debate if he wants to. 
Nobody ever wants to come on debate. Oh, he said I'm a cuck. Cucks himself into the shadows. No, I just uh, waited for him to hang himself, and when he did, I left the debate. And you can read everybody in the comments at Primal Edge Health. They got the point. Everybody in the comments under my my copy of the debate at my channel got the point. Uh, and everybody saw how silly what he was saying was. So he and his cult can do whatever they want, but I'm done with him. Stefan Molyneux will never debate because, uh, as we pointed out many times, a big name person has nothing to gain from debating lesser name, known people. They have everything to lose. Uh, should they lose the debate, it would look really bad for them. So why would they? There's no incentive for a Molyneux or a Peterson or anybody of that stature, that caliber in terms of popularity to debate somebody with you know, 10 or 100 times smaller audience. So no, they're, they're never going to debate. Now, maybe if I got a million followers one day, which probably won't ever happen, but if that ever did happen, maybe then they might debate, but I doubt it because it's a, it's a much safer territory to, to stay in, you know, acceptable modernist discourse. And you'll notice that none of the people allowed into the big scale discussion ever step outside of the classical liberal framework. Nobody outside of the classical liberal dialectic is even allowed into the debate or the discussion. So, I mean, even the alt-right, uh, who many of whom are basically still within the liberal framework, they're not even allowed into the, into the discussion. I mean, JF is still within the liberal framework in terms of his worldview, aside from uh, some sort of you know race view an IQ view, same with Stefan, Stefan Molyneux, they're still liberals. Uh, and they're not really allowed into the mainstream discourse. Uh, Molyneux, maybe to a degree, because of the size of his audience. Uh, but he's only, he's only allowed to do that because he still champions the market god. And we're going to see that when you, when you abandon philosophy, other things step in to to take the place of, of the God of the system. Uh, we're also going to see that people have a system, whether they want to or not, whether they believe in systems or not, they have a system. They have a worldview. They have a philosophy. They have a paradigm. Uh, when I speak of the liberal paradigm, I don't just mean empiricism. We just had a debate yesterday with an atheistic materialist on this very question. When I speak of liberalism, I'm talking about the classical liberal paradigm. And yes, empiricism is part of that tradition. The Enlightenment gives birth to the classical liberal paradigm. Renaissance humanism gives birth to it. Nominalism gives birth to it. Uh, the Protestant Reformation gives birth to it. Then comes right this Enlightenment, so-called, which is not a turn towards science, strictly speaking. People that have actually delved deeply into the history of the Enlightenment, know that it comes out of Hermeticism. They know that it comes out of Hermetic, Neoplatonic, Esoteric, Rosicrucian, Secret Societies, and Orders. You can read uh, Dame Francis Yates' book, Rosicrucian Enlightenment, which proves that beyond any shadow of a doubt. Now, I know that. I've known that since undergrad because I was studying all the Secret Societies at the same time as I was taking all my Enlightenment classes. It's not hard to figure that out. Uh, but who has read Dame Francis Yates' book, Rosicrucian Enlightenment? Not many people, even though it's a very famous book. Anyway, so uh, when I talk about the liberal tradition, I don't mean modern American liberalism. I don't just mean empiricism. I mean the entire tradition of the Enlightenment because it is a move towards liberalism. Now, some of those people would not necessarily be called, quote, liberal because maybe like Hobbes, they believed in a giant... Uh, Leviathan monolithic state, right? Hegel is a statist. So, uh, you know, Hegel's philosophy of the right, that's not liberal. However, all of these figures after the Enlightenment come out of revolutionary traditions, except for, you know, here and there, every now and then there's a, there's a gem in the midst of the, uh, the, the maelstrom here, the confusion that critiques it, right? You get, you get, uh, uh, writings about monarchy, you get writings against liberalism, uh, 
you know, in the West even after the revolutions. So again, our stance here is not that science is bad. All right? We believe that science has its place. And in fact, uh, you know, as Hoppe argues, right, in, in his points about democracy, the God that failed, uh, we're always told this mantra, this which is actually a revolutionary propaganda slogan, that uh, the Middle Ages was the Dark Ages. Monarchy is represents Dark Ages. And only because we have Republican democracies do we have advancement and progress. And in fact, Hoppe makes, I think, very good, consistent arguments that we could actually probably have been far more advanced had we not adopted the entire revolutionary ethos in the West. And of course, as you know, we've covered in countless articles, countless talks, and even in my book, the fact that the entire world has been infected with revolutionary thought. All of the revolutions are the same, as Aldous Huxley says. They all have the same point. They're all directed by the same people. And they're all toward, taking man towards technocracy. That's why the entire world is under the spell of democracy. That's why Hoppe is correct to call it a god that has failed. But it actually didn't fail because if you accept Huxley's thesis, it actually achieved its very purpose. The revolutions were there uh, to bulldoze all of the previous paradigms and to set up the moneyed oligarchy that we have now today that runs the world. Uh, if you don't understand this, then you don't know what you're talking about. And don't try to debate me. Go listen to my Tragedy and Hope talks. Because we know that the 20th century represents the rise of the fiat banking power to rule the world. Now we're living in the mopping up stages. And the goal was always to bring in a technocracy. Anyway, so when I talk about liberalism, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about rejecting the ideology of the last several hundred years of the West. I'm not talking about rejecting science, not talking about rejecting scientific discoveries, because as we've talked about many times, paradigms can be wrong. People can have erroneous, faulty paradigms or belief systems and make correct discoveries. They can make correct advancements. And even atheists who don't agree with me have to admit this, because they all know that there are theists who make advances in science and technology. Of course they do, right? But they think those theists are wrong and have the wrong paradigm, yet they are still able to make advances. Yeah. And that's because people aren't always as consistent as they should be, right? People are better than their belief systems and paradigms most of the time. Thank God, right? Because if everybody was completely consistent, we would have chaos <laughs> in terms of the atheistic materialistic worldviews, I'm saying. Um, anyway, so we want to talk about the fact that Again, this is something that has been missed. I've, no, I've noticed some patterns in the last few discussions and debates and talks that people are missing. And they're missing issues that relate to um, what they think are semantics, what they think are, are games or like talking around a problem or trying to like do sh what did he what did, what did that one guy say? The kid said, uh, you're being shady. Right. When you talk about the fact that logic presupposes that you should follow through, you know, the, to, to the conclusion through a syllogism to the, to the conclusion that you should right that there's a, there's some binding imperative force behind logic. That's being shady. You're being shady. Uh, no, I mean, this is just retarded. OK, so. Oh, God, here we go. Science, in terms of the scientific principle, is a new development. It is a creature of the Enlightenment. Previously, there were uh, ways to seek truth, but they weren't science. This is just retarded. Uh, in, in fact, the ancient Greeks practiced science. Uh, many of the Christian theologians of the Middle Age practiced science. So you really have no idea what you're talking about, vodka. Uh, you are just repeating, essentially, the propaganda of the Enlightenment, right? Uh, I mean, look at how many inventions and discoveries come out of the Middle Ages, something that you're not taught, of course, in the modern university. So I'm, I'm actually I'm going to just delete this guy because uh, we're not here to have like basic bitch level debates here. Um, the scientific method is not new to the Enlightenment period. The scientific method as a means by which the this is the only way to have reliable knowledge is new to the to the period of the Enlightenment. That's true. 
uh, but countless people back to the ancient world uh, utilized the principles of the scientific method. Uh, Aristotle, you can go back to the ancient Greeks, Aristotle was a scientist. Aristotle practiced uh, the, the, the scientific method, right? Uh, now, so again, my grad work in part was in terms of science, uh, of philosophy of science. So uh, the, the questions that philosophy of science asks are different than the questions that normative science involves itself with. And the problem is that most people who study science and hard sciences don't know philosophy, so that they don't know what's being said or what's being asked when people ask, bring these kinds of questions to bear. They think that it's semantics, they think that it's word games, and it's not. Asking uh, basic questions about metaphysics, about ethics, and about epistemology is just classic philosophy. And because scientism especially has a problem uh, and has actually presuppositions and an agenda behind uh, the rejecting of these branches of philosophy, and ultimately philosophy itself, as Neil deGrasse Tyson says, philosophy is essentially worthless. It's no longer needed anymore now that we have science. I mean, this is so laughable and so absurd uh, that, and by the way, he was actually uh, law, he was actually made fun of by uh, not a few philosophers when he made that statement. Um, it's really just speaks from ignorance. I mean, extreme ignorance, uh, because you can, the, the idea that you can master, say, some branch of of hard sciences and that therefore this gives you some preeminent insight into all of reality is itself uh, a fraudulent stupid assumption right so for example a lot of biologists will assume right jf does this he assumes that because he studied uh, biology at a graduate level that therefore this is some sort of all-encompassing paradigm answer to everything right we can we can approach uh, uh grand mythological narratives from the questions of, of the life sciences and biology. But of course, that just assumes that biology is the lens by which everything should be read. Uh, and what philosophy does is that it asks the questions about presuppositions. It asks questions about, is that really the case? Uh, can we know that? Can we demonstrate that? Now, every atheist, rational, scientific materialist, blah, 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 reductionist, they claim to be, to be logical. They claim to be rational. They claim to be the guardians of reason and science over against superstition. Uh, however, when we begin to start asking questions about what logic is, how logic functions in the world, uh, we are immediately met with nothing but derision and the accusation that those are essentially stupid questions, the relics of an old age. Uh, and, but of course they're not. And that's because modern scientism has no answer to these questions. And that's why we're here today to defend traditional philosophy, metaphysics. So, again, so let's talk about. Okay, so we got uh, the questions are coming in quicker than I can than I can respond. If I if I uh, um, No, this is simply not true. I mean, you obviously haven't read Aristotle, Vodka. If you've read Aristotle, you know that he proceeds from an empirical scientific method. He's, he, that's why he's the father of taxonomy. He's the father of all of these branches of science that involve empirical uh, investigation. So, in fact, all of the Enlightenment thinkers who, who talked about returning to the scientific method were part of the classicist tradition. They were part of the, the Renaissance tradition that wanted to go back to the Greeks and specifically the empirical approach to science that Aristotle embodied. So you haven't read Aristotle. Oh, no. So he's the one guy who did that at a time when everyone disagreed with him. No, that's simply not true. In fact, many of the church fathers were influenced by Aristotle. Uh, so you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Aristotle had an entire school, right? Lyceum. That, that he taught. So the idea that this is only Aristotle, uh, I think we're about, it's about time to delete this dude. I've had enough of his retardation. So you're out of here. So we're not going to deal with that. He thinks Aristotle was the one guy, and here's Ar Aristotle has a, a tremendous influence on the history of the church. Uh, again, how many times have we recommended St. John Damascus's Fount of Knowledge? which has a lot of good things to say about Aristotle. Um, that does not mean that we're Aristotelians. It's, again, mistake. 
All right. So let's before we get into the 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 stuff is coming in so quick I can't keep up keep up with all these questions. But let's get in first to the question of um, the theological question that was asked earlier uh, about Saint John Chrysostom, um, which was that how is it that uh, Jesus says to the Syrophoenician woman in Mark seven? that it's not proper to give to the dogs what is for the children. So now there's two errors that people make uh, that I've seen over the years in my, the Gentile woman that believes, and this is Mark 7, 24 through 30. Now, the two errors that people make on this is that, on the one hand, there's the Christian so-called Zionist heresy, which usually is tied, of course, to dispensationalism. And they think that uh, there's like these plans that went into effect and changed when man failed, right? So like there was a dispensation to Noah, and then when man failed, God instituted a new plan. Uh, and, and what that does is essentially divides up and, and destroys the continuity of the scriptures, destroys the fact that there's one church from Abel all the way to the New Testament. We are all members of the same church, right? Um, Abraham is a saint in our church. Moses is a saint in our church. Okay, this is crucial to understanding the continuity of the Old and New Testament. They are members of the body of Christ. They're pictured in the apocalypse as worshiping alongside the saints of the New Testament. So they were not saved in a different way. They were not saved by keeping the law or any of the nonsense that uh, many of these stupid evangelical sects believe they were saved by their faith in Christ. Paul reiterates this point many times in the New Testament, Romans 4, Galatians 3. So they didn't have a different pathway to God. There's never been a different pathway to God. It's always through faith in either the coming Messiah, looking forward to him, or faith in the Messiah who has come, us now in the church era. They're not saved in a different way. There was no way to, to keep the law. But even in the period that we're talking about, when God established the nation of Israel, <clears throat> there were still converts. We read about converts in the Exodus. There were people who in Egypt who had converted to the worship of the true God. Uh, when <clears throat> Ezra went out and established the synagogue system, we read about the converts. Right? There were converts to the worship of the true God of Israel, mentioned even in the book of Acts. <clears throat> there was the dispersion, that is, the Jews that were out outside of Israel that had been set up in other cities where, they again, they had synagogues, and there were many converts in those cities. <clears throat> so the Judaism of this period accepted converts. In fact, Abraham was a convert, the founder of so-called Judaism, well, in the sense of the nation of Israel, right? Abraham was himself a convert out of paganism. Now, a lot of people get confused with this, and then they think that, so what happens is that uh, in the New Testament, Jesus came, and because these verses say that he came first to his own, to the Jews, then there must have been some sort of new dispensation that was invented. This is what the, the Christian Zionist heretics say. There was a new dispensation that came about after the Jews rejected Christ, and then it went to the Gentiles. This is so stupid that it's almost unfathomable that anyone believes it. For one, how many times in the New Testament, the latter chapters of Romans, right, uh, many times in the, in, in the Gospels, there are quotations from the Psalms and the major and minor prophets that I've covered in my talks about the Gentiles converting. So if the prophets prophesied the Gentiles converting, that was always the plan. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't plan B, according to these idiot evangelicals. No, the Gentile church was always the plan because it's the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that in his seed, all of the nations would be brought into the worship of the true God. His seed is Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the covenants of the past. Every one of the covenants, again, from Adam to Noah to Moses or to Abraham to Moses to David, they all are foreshadowing Jesus the awaiting prophet, priest, and king to come who fulfills all these predictions. And in his death, burial, and resurrection, which is a amazing mystery that God 
worked in terms of his providence. God foreknew that the Jews would reject him. In fact, it was predicted that the Jews would reject him all throughout their prophets. They rejected him, and so the salvation uh, that they thought they were destroying went to the nations. And this is how the promises are fulfilled. It's a no-brainer, really. I mean, this is, again, nobody ever taught any of this dispensational Judaized nonsense in the history of the church. That's why it's promoted by the Royal Society, the, Roth the Rothschilds, and Oxford, who printed the Schofield Study Bible that popularized it prior to the established, pr right prior to the uh, Balfour Declaration, by the way. <laughs> no accident there. Now, so on the one hand, we have the Judaized error, which believes that there's some, and some guy was messaging me yesterday saying that I don't accept orthodoxy because you don't keep all the Jewish feasts and fasts. And I was like, I'm like, well, uh, have you read Galatians and Hebrews? And he's like, yes, I have, but Paul's wrong. <laughs> uh, and so I go to the guy's profile and his profile is all a bunch of Masonic stuff. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why uh, we ended up blocking that guy. But um, yeah, so on the one hand, there is the, the error of trying to think that salvation can be had through uh, the keeping of the ceremonies of the law. And again, this was the chief battle of the first century church. This is the chief battle of the book of Acts, is this question. They have to have a council in Acts 15 to settle this question. What does the council in Acts 15 say? Well, basically it looks back to the Noahide laws, to the laws of Noah. It says, essentially, in reaffirming the covenant with Noah, that the church, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, the apostles under the direction of Christ and the Holy Spirit, make a decision, they make a determination in a synod, in a synodal decree, that it is not necessary for Gentiles to keep the ceremonial laws of Moses uh, and to receive circumcision. Because, again, uh, there are plenty of righteous men prior to the giving of the ceremonial law, and therefore ceremonial law cannot be necessary to be saved. All right, this is Paul's argument. Paul says uh, Abraham was accounted righteous prior to ceremonial laws being given, prior to the establishment of national Israel, prior to the giving of circumcision. Circumcision was a sign and seal for entrance into the national covenant of Israel of that time. And it was proper and good at that time. But it was a type that looked forward, looked forward to fulfillment in baptism, which is something easily, that can, easily accessible water that can be given to everybody, not just young males. Now, part of the reason that there was circumcision, too, was because of the transmission of ancestral sin. Right? Ancestral sin comes from all the children of Adam because of Adam's fall. So there was also that aspect to it as well. Uh, circumcision was supposed to signify uh, a tearing away of the old man, as Paul says. Uh, as Jeremiah says, even in the Old Testament, Jeremiah says that circumcision signified repen repentance and rending of the heart. Circumcise your hearts, Jeremiah says. That was the whole point of it. Looking forward to baptism. So now that the Messiah has come, now that Christ has instituted his church, uh, the New Testament essentially settles all of these disputes. Again, you don't even have to go to the church fathers. You don't even have to go outside of the New Testament to see all of these disputes settled. So let's go to the let's look at the other opposite error, which is kind of being popularized by some blogs. Um, sort of selectively takes certain church fathers out of context, and it says, "Oh, uh, uh, Judaism basically stopped existing at some uh, undefined point." And there were no Jews. Jews do not exist in the New Testament. This is a, an invention. This is nonsense, too. All right? And so this kind of a perspective goes to the opposite extreme and doesn't understand, and it borders basically on a kind of Marcionism, doesn't understand the importance of the place of the Old Testament, of the covenants of the Old Testament, of the law, and even the ceremonies in preparation for the coming of Christ. And so... Jesus, when he talks to the woman at the well in John 4, is very clear. And what he says to her is, based, this, is this is interesting, it's, it's, a, it's a great exemplary test case because what happens is the woman at the well, and she's a Samaritan, right? Now, Samaritans were schismatics that, goes, that go back to the time of uh, the split of the northern and southern kingdom of Israel and Judah, uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, right? And we have basically Jeroboam setting up his own state-controlled pagan sex cult religion. This is the origin of Samaritanism. 
So, so the Samaritans had this kind of schismatic idea that they had come up with that that uh, the temple is not where you worship God. You know, what does she say? It says, uh, oh, it's Jacob's well. You know, we worship at Jacob's well or something. Now, what does Jesus say? Does Jesus say, uh, nothing in the Old Testament matters. I came to destroy all that. No, 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 no. He doesn't say that. Does he say there were no Jews? Jews didn't exist. That is an invention of uh, Talmudic Pharisees. No, no, no. He doesn't say that. He says, woman, he says, you know not what you worship. He says, you are a Samaritan. So Jesus doesn't wipe away all the religious distinctions. He essentially affirms, you are a heretic. Right? You are a schismatic. You, you, you do think that you're worshiping the true God, but you do, not, you do not know what you worship. Okay, So she was in error. She was in schism. Jesus then, of course, demonstrates that he has omniscience by talking about uh, her many wa- uh, husbands or lovers because she's not married. Uh, and the woman is then, of course, convicted. She says, oh, I perceive that you're a prophet. And she Right, she had tried to steer the conversation into religious controversy, and Jesus brings it back to the the question of uh, moral problem. He's like, no, your your issue is moral. Uh, it's it's not an issue of like abstract theological questions. You have a moral issue. So then Jesus goes on to say that truly, I'm I say to you that in the time is coming and now is when the worshippers of God will worship God in spirit and in truth, not just on. Uh, not just in the temple, but in all places. So in other words, the worship of God is not going to be restricted to the temple, which it previously had been, which was by God's design on purpose. It is then to extend into all of the nations in the church. But the key point to remember here is that Jesus is stressing that salvation is of the Jews. There was no salvation in any other place. You could not find the true worship of God uh, in some other nation. Now, before the establishment of the nation of Israel, it's possible, uh, plausible, that there were in some way priests like Melchizedek or people like uh, uh, Job, right, who were righteous men outside of the nation of Israel who had in some way maintained the true uh, tradition from Abel. Right? So this is most likely how and why uh, Job or Jethro uh, or uh, Melchizedek, uh, who are not Levitical priests, still had knowledge of and understanding of and belief of in the one true God, right? And presumably also belief in a coming Messiah. In fact, Job uh, predicts Christ. There are multiple uh, Messianic prophecies in the book of Job. And Job was not written by a Jew, it's written by a Gentile. So Job himself, by the way, shows us that there were true uh, Gentile believers even in the Old Testament. So now let's look at this passage then. When Jesus says to the Syrophoenician woman that Gentiles are dogs, uh, he is not making this up out of nowhere. He is reaffirming what is in the Old Testament. Right now, so now a lot of people who take this opposite view, they think that it's it's somehow wrong to 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 talk about the fact that the Old Testament, particularly the Psalms, right, in many places, it's not just a Talmudic invention that the the law and the prophets uh, and the Psalms speak of the nations in this way. They do because they were that way. <laughs> they were dogs because they acted that way. Right? They were into some seriously degenerate stuff. And yes, it eventually infected Israel too. And Israel fell into the worship of serious degenerate stuff. So it's not like, I mean, this is the point is that both of these things are true. It's not either or, right? There were, there were periods when uh, Israel was faithful to God in some instances. And when that was the case, God would subdue their enemies. And David can write Psalms talking about the nations being heathens being degenerate and deserving of uh, divine justice, right? How many times does David say this in the Psalms? How many times do the prophets say that? Multiple times. Yet at the same time, it's also true that the same accusations are turned back on Israel itself. When Israel starts to act like the nations, the prophets say, you are a whore. Israel is Sodom. Israel is Gomorrah. Okay, so these things can all be true at the same time. Okay, so Jesus is being consistent uh, 
when he affirms the fact that it was true that the nations were dog-like and heathen. The gift of the covenant was not given to all nations. It was given only to the nation of Israel. I'm speaking after Abraham, of course, right? So, so that is the norm and that is true and that is correct. Paul does not say that Moses was not a legitimate covenant from God. It is Jesus who, who made the covenant with Moses. This is crucial. And every Orthodox person makes this very apologetic argument. So they, even the people who don't understand this already agree with me when they look at the burning bush and they say, that's Jesus speaking in the burning bush. Jesus says, I am that I am. Multiple times in John 7, Jesus says, I am that I am. I am, right? So it's Jesus in the burning bush. And it's Jesus making the covenant with Moses. Again, it's not that difficult when you understand basic continuity between the Old and New Testament. Now, when we understand that, we we see then that it is in fact true. Just think of Israel as the church of the Old Covenant. And so just as in the New Covenant, the church can pray imprecatory prayers and pray against her enemies, which she does and has for 2,000 years, so likewise did they do the same thing in the church of Israel in the Old Testament. It was no different. Now, there are differences in, in, in the sense of uh, modus operandi. Like, you know, we don't principally try to go to war against Canaanites. <laughs> Although, at times, the church, well, I should say Orthodox nations and kings have gone to war. Everybody knows this. Uh, basic church history, right? So, even though there's a, there's a shift in emphasis between the uh, Old Testament period focusing on uh, a more external battle-related scenario of, of the conquest of Cana, etc., that was a type, Paul says. The conquest of Cana was a type of the church uh, conquering the world. All right, Paul makes this, this analogy very clear in the New Testament. So the typology of Cana's land is, a, is, the, is the spiritual is fulfilled in the spiritual approach of the church going out and conquering the nations through the preaching of the gospel, essentially pulling down the demons that the nations worship. That's the true battle, the true uh, conquest of Canaan that is happening now in our very day in the last 2000 years. Um, does that mean that in the old Testament, there were no demons? No, of course not. Demons are mentioned multiple times in the old Testament. Does that mean the old Testament wasn't spiritual? No. Right. Think about, how many times prophets see into the spiritual realm and they see chariots fighting with the, the, the armies of Israel. They, they see into Isaiah sees into heaven and he sees, uh, you know, uh, in Isaiah six, he sees, uh, he sees God. In fact, and by, by the way, John says, uh, in, in his gospel that when Isaiah looked into heaven, he saw Christ <laughs> by the way. So, uh, anyway, When we understand that, we understand that uh, Jesus's mission, it was appropriate. Paul affirms this too, by the way, that uh, in Romans, he says that to the Jews were given the covenant. They were given the law. They were given the promises. They were given the fathers, et cetera, et cetera. So naturally, Jesus had to come to the Jews first who were his people. And salvation was offered first to the Jew. Right. This is why Paul says to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. This is why in the book of Acts, the apostles uh, go and preach the gospel first to the Jews. Salvation is offered first to the Jews. And what happens? Well, many, many accept it. Uh, many also reject it. Right. And so we think of the, the section in Acts where Paul says, since you reject it, we now go to the Gentiles. And if you read through the book of Acts, you'll see that, you know, it's the Holy Spirit essentially directing this process. Okay. So, um, for example, at one point, uh, the Spirit forbids the church to spread the gospel into an area of Asia. We don't know why. We're not told why the Spirit forbade uh, the gospel going into that region. We don't know. Apparently, it would be some other time, right? Uh that's the counsels of God. We don't fully understand all the counsels of God. But what we do have in Revelation is a lot of information uh, about, you know, the kinds of things that I'm saying. We do have information about how to make sense of these texts. Uh, Jesus is not being inconsistent when he says that this woman uh, is a Gentile, and she is. And that was important for uh, 
in the history of redemption, that was important for that phase in history. Now that the church has been established, right? And by the way, Jesus grants the woman's wish. So even though she was a Gentile, even though she did have this uh, affiliation with uh, pagan culture, Jesus still grants her her supplication. And in fact, multiple times in the Gospels, Jesus preaches to Gentiles. He preaches to schismatics, right? And right, this is the story of the Good Samaritan, right? And that's because, as many of the church fathers point out, the the gospel examples of like the Roman centurion and so forth, believing in Christ, these are prefigurations of the fact that the Gentiles will in large accept the message of the gospel. And uh, many, many of the Jews will not. And uh, as a nation, the Jewish nation falls under God's judgment precisely because they reject their Messiah. So, long story short, both of those positions are incorrect. There's the extreme of thinking that some, I don't know where they get this, this idea that, that the word Jew was not in the Bible. It was invented by Talmudic persons like hundreds of years after the coming of Christ. It's very retarded. Um, if you read Zechariah 8, there's a prediction that thus says the Lord Almighty, in, the de- in those days, ten men from all the nations around excuse me, 10 men from all the tongues of the nations will stop you and ask you and grab a hold of you. And they will say to a Jewish man, we will go with you for we have heard God is with you. Well, this is Pentecost. This is what happens on Pentecost. This is what happens when Jesus sends the Jewish apostles out into the world. Right? Many, many, many nations cling on to these apostles and they say, we have heard God is with you. Tell us about your God. This is a prediction of Pentecost and the apostles in the New Testament. And they were all Jews. Okay. And by the way, Zechariah 8 is using the word Jew. <laughs> so Jew is not a post-New Testament Talmudic invention. It's completely retarded. All right. Um we went, I've already gone 50 minutes on just that one question. So I hope, hopefully that is illustrative. People can, can benefit from that. But uh, beyond that, I'm not really seeing what action Jackson or whatever that dude's name was. I don't really see the problem in what he, what he asked. Um, I think he was tripped up by the fact that Jesus affirmed that Gentiles were dogs. Well, this is in the Psalms, right? This is in the prophets. And it's not because they weren't humans, it's because they acted like dogs. And so, by the way, this is important. For example, this is something a lot of people misunderstand. I had a debate one time on the street with a Hasidic Jew who started uh, a conversation with me, interestingly. Um, he started talking about uh, the Old Testament. I think he thought I was Jewish. I don't know, but he was like, are you a Jew? And I was like, well, uh, in the true sense, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, what? So we got in this debate and he said, he said uh, his view was that the law didn't apply to Gentiles. It was only for Israel. And I was like, well, okay, the law given at Mount Sinai was for Israel, but God still held nations accountable for their sins. In other words, for example, if you read Joshua, the reason that God sends Joshua into Canaan's land for the conquest is because of the wickedness of those nations. That means they're held accountable for their wickedness. How many times in the prophets do the prophets talk about the nations being wicked, violating God's law? Well, what law were they violating if they weren't under God's law? They were under the law, moral law. What laws were they violating uh, when Nebuchadnezzar, you know, was arrogant and prideful and blasphemed the God of the Jews, the true God? Well, he gets struck with madness and acts like a damn fool out in the wood for seven years, like an animal. So he offended some kind of <laughs> moral law, uh, right? So, and it wasn't, by the way, it's not just Noahide laws, okay? So the Noahic covenant was a covenant, and it wasn't in effect. And and again, if you understand Acts 15, they are referring back to the Noahide laws in Acts 15. That's what the first council of the church at Acts, in Acts 15 in Jerusalem looked back to, to to determine the normative 
statutes for receiving Gentiles into the predominantly Jewish church of that time, right? Jewish converts to Christianity. The entire early church is Jewish, okay? The whole thing. It's founded by Jews, predominantly Jews, right? The first 10 chapters of Acts. And this, if you read Acts 10, right, when we get to the story of Cornelius, this is why Peter is so confused. Peter has such a hard time with this question because of his grounding in, you know, the Jewish law and prophets. So he's very confused. And in fact, Peter's so confused that it actually requires visions directly from God, <laughs> right? He sees the vision of the sheet with the unclean animals. And again, in the Old Testament, unclean animals represented the unclean nations, the Gentiles, and demons. If you doubt that they represent demons, read Isaiah 34, where Lilith is mentioned, uh, and other demons are pictured in Isaiah 34 under the imagery of unclean birds, storks, owls, etc. It even mentions satyrs there, by the way, goat demons. So that was even present in the Old Testament. Anyway... Uh, where were we? We were talking about Cornelius. Right? So uh, the sheet comes down, right, in Peter's vision, and it's got unclean animals in it, and God says, eat. Peter says, no. By the way, that's not a vegan command, is it? <laughs> uh, the, the biblical God's not vegan, by the way. Uh, Peter says, no, I can't eat those. Those are unclean. So this vision happens three times, and God says, what I call clean, don't call unclean. So that's what it took for Peter to finally be convinced. And even after that, Peter was still had doubts because Paul had to get in Peter's face over it. Remember, this is mentioned in the beginning of Galatians. Paul and Peter have a big falling out over it because Peter still keeps falling back into the temptations of thinking that uh, Gentiles are not fully inheritors of the promises with Jews. But they are. However... For the period of the Old Covenant, it was true that there was supposed to be a separation. For example, uh, the temple itself, worship itself during the Old Covenant period did not allow Gentiles into the temple. You had you could come to, as a worshiper of the true God of Israel, to the outer portico. That was allowed for converts. All right, this is Jew, the Gentiles who had converted to the God of Israel. But you couldn't go into the temple. Now, who set that up? God did. Okay, so this wasn't some thing that Moses made up. It wasn't something that the evil God of the Old Testament made up. It was put into place for a time period until, as Hebrews said, the time of Reformation came. What's the time of Reformation? The New Covenant. The New Covenant is not something that just happens when Jesus dies. The New Covenant is established from the entire period of the first century from the incarnation birth of Christ all the way up to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That is the establishment of the new covenant. That whole period and all of the events of that period are crucial to fulfilling all of these Old Testament prophecies and ushering in the last days. This is also important because consistently in the Old Testament, for example, the prophecy of Joel, Joel says that the last days are instituted when Pentecost happens. Right? Joel's not talking about the end of the world. It might have a reference to the end of the world, but Joel says that the last days begin when the Spirit is poured out on all flesh. Peter says Joel was talking about Pentecost. Pentecost happened in Acts 2. Okay, Can you read? Can you make the connection between the fact that Peter in Acts 2 is quoting Joel? Joel is not talking about some garbage on TBN, what John Hagee says. Joel's talking about Pentecost, which happens in Acts 2. By the way, that refutes basically the entirety of dispensationalism. So, the Spirit being pulled out, poured out on all flesh equally also shows that there's no longer the distinction in the ritual ceremonial sense that was necessary and important for the Old Testament period now. Okay, it's no longer important now. Uh, there's no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. By the way, Paul's not a transgender advocate. Paul is not saying that that means there's no such thing as Jews and Greeks anymore. No, of course they still exist. And it's only the idiot retards that quote that verse to try to prove stupid egalitarian presuppositions. That verse has nothing to do with that. Paul elsewhere says, slaves submit to your masters, women submit to your husbands, right? 
Jews and Greeks are still Jews and Greeks. They don't erase all their heritage. This is all the liberal presupposition, the modernist presupposition that tries to wrest Christianity from its historical context and lie and take verses out of context. Uh, Paul is saying that salvation comes to all people of any status in life. Paul is not saying that Christianity is a revolutionary force to overthrow structures and governments and to set up some tranny egalitarian uh, globo homo uh, world system as these idiots try to make it. Nobody could honestly read the rest of the New Testament and actually think that. So it's only lying, deceiving people uh, who, who take those verses out to try to, to try to prove that. They don't know what they're talking about. So anyway, um, uh, Paul, even in Romans 9 through 11, seems to also uphold the fact that uh, Jews will continue to even be Jews uh, until the time of their conversion. Right, and I do think many of the fathers. By the way, I just found a whole much bunch more verses where uh, the fathers actually back this up. Cyril of Alexandria, by the way, appears to have been very convinced that many of these texts predict a future conversion of the Jews. Uh, the Orthodox Study Bible, in fact, mentions this in many places. I think that that's true. I think Romans eleven just very clearly is making again, as I've pointed out many times, the claim that eventually Jews will convert. I don't know when that is. We don't know when that is. But I think that that's the obvious meaning of what Paul's saying. Now, do, I'm, do I think that necessarily has anything to do with the founding of the state of Israel? No, I do not. Uh, I don't see where that necessarily fits into any of this. I'm going by what's in Revelation. I'm not interested in reading uh, you know, headlines into Scripture. That's what Hal Lindsey and John Hagee and all those retards do. We don't do that. We don't read news headlines into the Bible. We don't look at the fact that uh, you know, the Antichrist is, is uh, you know, mentioned in a bunch of movies and then, then try to read that into the Bible and say, we're in the last days. The, the, I mean, people, somebody, somebody was making that comment on one of my videos. They were like, you, you have a mental illness because you think that these Hollywood movies are saying that the Antichrist is coming. Uh, no, if you've listened to what I said, uh, you know that I actually make fun of that. I make fun of the, the argument like the Crowleyans had that, that, uh, that you could invoke the Antichrist by doing a bunch of rituals and that, that John's book of Revelation is a Gnostic ritual text. I talk about how stupid that is. And the only reason Crow Crowley thought that was because he was, guess what, raised in a retarded dispensationalist sect. The Plymouth Brethren is where dispensationalism comes from. Did you know that? Yep. John Nelson Darby, all right, Plymouth Brethren. Oh, they also happen to produce Aleister Crowley. So the only, only reason Crowley and his stupidity and ignorance thought that he could turn the book of Revelation into a magical text for invoking the Antichrist and bring it into fruition and having sex with the whore of Babylon and all this nonsense. <laughs> John's not talking about Crowley, dude. <laughs> so I, I constantly talk about how stupid this is. Uh, so the guy who assumed that I was like reading movies and headlines into the Bible had no idea what I was talking about. So anyway, let's keep in mind too that in Mark 7, before I end on this topic, um, Jesus says that um, Jesus rebukes the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. So it's in the context uh, of this, the story of calling the woman a dog is in the context of, uh, of rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees. Now that's important because it shows us that Jesus, there's not a, there's not like a, a catchphrase by which we can, you know, lift these verses out of context, right? Like a lot of times, like a Baptist will try to say something like, you believe the traditions of men in your Orthodox church. You follow the traditions of men. Jesus said to the Pharisees, don't follow the traditions of men. Well, uh, he also in other places does say, follow the traditions. <laughs> so, uh, right, this is a different the question, right? The question of whether there's oral tradition is a different question from whether or not there's the traditions of men. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees had invented and put into place a bunch of traditions of men, which if you listen to the Jeremiah lectures, Jeremiah talked about. Jeremiah said in his day that the scribes and Pharisees had done this and it was a problem and that they were uh, 
circumventing the law itself. Jesus reaffirms Jeremiah. And in fact, there are whole chapters in Jeremiah that mirror the ministry of Jesus. We pointed that out in the Jeremiah talk, which shows continuity, by the way. Um, but the reason I bring that up is because Jesus can, at the on the one hand, talk about the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees and the fact that they had invented traditions of men. And at the same time, in Matthew 23, he says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Therefore, do as they say, but not as they do, because they're hypocrites. But they were the established religious authority. Notice he does not mention the Sadducees. Why? Because they were the liberals. They were not the established authority. There was a hierarchical established authority, and it was the scribal Pharisaic system that Ezra set up. Ezra set up the synagogue system. Moses talked about the need for a synagogue system. Ezra then set it up later on. There's no such thing in the Old Testament as a seat of Moses, right? There's no moses Stolic succession mentioned. However, Jesus says that this is true. They do sit in the seat of Moses. They are the legitimate, authoritative expounders, expositors, and judges of the law. Yes, they're hypocrites. However, they still retain a position of authority. Jesus says that they are much more liable to condemnation than the rest of the people because of that role of authority. And we see this in the Old Testament as well, right? God judges David or the rulers or the kings or the heads of things far more severely than he judges the normal, the normies. <laughs> um, I mean, he judged Adam pretty severely because Adam was the head of the human race. How severely does God judge David? Pretty severely, right? When when David, uh, what happens to the offspring that uh, David has with Bathsheba? Oh, yeah, exactly. So in the same way, we have to understand that uh, the, there is at the same time traditions of men as there is legitimate oral tradition. Right? Both of those things are true. Uh, Jesus can uh, rebuke the Pharisees and talk, call them hypocrites while at the same time recognizing that they have uh, legitimate authority. So, it's that simple, really. All right, I'll read a couple super chats before we move back to philosophy because uh, I kind of went for an hour on that one theology question. And really, really what we were coming to talk about was... Um, Uh, the philosophy, that's okay. You know, we want to go with whatever anybody's interested in. That's what we'll talk about. Uh, I did say we could talk theology today. So we're taking challenges and questions today. Uh, the first question, Evan Schultz, thank you for that. You've been killing it, Jay. I found a challenging discussion. I found it challenging discussing orthodoxy with women as they find it sexist. Any tips? Uh, well, uh, I mean, modern women are, of course, bathed in the idea that patriarchy or religions that have only male authorities and priests are sexist. There's not much you can do about it because, you know, Jesus set it up. So their problem ultimately is with Jesus. Um, too bad. I mean, I wouldn't worry uh, if people, I mean, in other words, you can't water down these facts to like, you know, appease uh, 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 some some feminist. I wouldn't worry about it. Just move on. My 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 tip would be to move on to somebody else. Um. By the way, this is why we have to watch out for feminists, is because people like Angela Dahl Carlson, uh, who hopes and prays for women's ordination to the priesthood. Uh, these people want to change the church, right? This Miriam Yusuf woman. All right, she's blogging about all this trans. Uh, this. Uh, microaggressions and social justice warriors. They, these people want to change the church. Uh, sorry, but you don't have the right to do that. And you're working from a spirit of wickedness. What does, what does scripture say that the spirit of rebellion is like? The spirit of rebellion is like witchcraft. The sin of rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So get out of here, witches. Any significance to old baptism being for men only? Uh, that is not true. I don't know what you mean, old baptism. 
you mean circumcision? Uh, if you mean circumcision, then yes, uh, as I pointed out, circumcision signified uh, ancestral sin on the one hand in the sense of the transition, the, the transmission of uh, ancestral um, sin through all the descendants of Adam, and that transmission is had through the male member. It's the semen that creates a new human being. That doesn't mean that women didn't have ancestral sin. All human beings did. Uh, but <clears throat> the transmission occurs through uh, the sexual copulation act from one generation to the next. And by the way, that doesn't mean that ancestral sin is a thing, a substance that, that somehow meant that uh, uh, humans were tainted. Uh, corruption and sin are not things that are, they're not things. Right. As the fathers say, evil is lo only located in the turn of the will away from the good. However, all of Adam's descendants have these same propensities because they have his fallen nature. When we talk about fallen or corrupted nature, we don't mean that the nature itself is inherently evil. This is the error of Manichaeans, of Calvinists, Lutherans, and Protestants. Many times uh, they conceive of original sin as somehow being something connected to man's nature itself which is to then give sin substance or being or ontological existence, which is the Manichaean heresy. Sin does not have ontological being or existence. It's not a thing. It's a move of the will away from the good. So baptism, uh, so the significance of circumcision uh, was only to be a type of baptism. And what it was supposed to teach, as we said, according to Jeremiah, was to throw off the foreskin of your hearts. In other words, you have hard hearts. Uh, you need to cut away the the outer hard-heartedness that you have, right? And the reason that you have this is because you are a son of Adam. That's why. Dan Mann, what do you think are the problems with praxeology? Uh, go listen to the debates with Robert Taylor. We had multiple debates, one, two, three debates with Robert Taylor on theism and capitalism and the, the problems are all outlined there it's a retarded uh, system based in marxism and anarchism um, based on the idea of uh, calculating human actions as if you're some sort of computer it's a completely autistic retarded thing um yeah uh, and all three of the debates with robert taylor preeminent proponent of praxeology shows how retarded it is. Paul Albert, thank you, $50. Thank you for all you do, Jay. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you for supporting my work, and and I will continue to put this stuff out as long as we have support uh, and uh, the freedom to talk about these things. Robert Taylor, not the same Robert Taylor, by the way. Uh, what's a good elevator pitch for orthodoxy for Protestants and Catholics? My wife and I get a lot of what is orthodoxy. Um, I wouldn't try to do quick elevator pitches. I would just just uh, send people the documentary on the icon, right? which is a, a popular YouTube documentary. I think it's uh, it's like three hours, but uh, if the person's not willing to invest three hours in the documentary, then they're not that interested anyway. Uh, and so anybody who is willing to invest three, three hours in the icon documentary, uh, I would say is worth talking to. So uh, that icon documentary is really good. Jim strange, $5 best apologetics on YouTube. Thank you, Jay. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, there's not a lot of apologetics going on on YouTube. Really? I mean, that's that good. So thank you. In other words, uh, I don't think it's necessarily that I'm that good, but not a lot of apologetics out there anyway that's any good, right? I mean, all these Protestant presuppositionalists, they're terrible. Good grief. Uh, they give transcendental arguments a bad name, by the way. So uh, so thank you there, Jim Strange. Randy Churchill, $20. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate that. White Top, $2. Thank you, White Top. All right, excellent. Uh, really appreciate you guys. All right, we, we do want to get to some philosophy here. I don't want to mire everyone in the theological minutia, although it was important. Again, people are confused over two extremes on the one hand of uh, Judaizing heresy of the evangelicals, and then they go to the other extreme of some sort of weird Gnostic thing where uh, 
uh, Marcionism type thing where like the idea of Jew was some later invention and I don't know, it's just, people don't know what they're talking about. That's because they don't know the Bible. That's the problem here is that people are not actually familiar with what's in scripture. Uh, so they, they read these blogs and these websites and these, they come up with these weird views and trust me, I know I've spent 20 years wandering through all of these different views. You know, I mean, I went from being a Baptist, I grew up Baptist, um, into, uh, reading the church fathers, church history, right. Calvinism and then Catholicism. Uh, and this is before I even knew about orthodoxy, right? So orthodoxy is kind of a hidden thing in America. You really have to seek it out. Uh, and orthodoxy doesn't have, it's not like all, there's no more problems, right? I mean, any church, any place you go, there's going to be problems, but, uh, um, I find that orthodoxy, historically speaking, traditional orthodox theology really has the answers to, to all of these, these difficulties. Um, you know, so, okay. Uh, we're going to get to the philosophy now, defense of traditional philosophy and metaphysics. I'm going to recommend a bunch of good books and essays here, uh, because I think we probably will have a lot of, uh, inquirers or, or challengers or, People curious uh, in regard to atheism, in regard to evolution, in regard to scientism, in regard to to uh, anti-metaphysical, deontologist, deconstructionist type views. So we want to get to all that. Okay, so he did mean he did mean circumcision as old baptism. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's a good way to put it. Uh, you could look at uh, Israel is old church. Uh, circumcision is old baptism. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. Um, so we're going to play the song real quick just because I need to pour more coffee. And after a, an entire pot of coffee, I got to have some, uh, I got to have some, some pee pee time. I got to go whiz. Got to drain the lizard as the kids say. Here's some music. Jason Allison. 
So let's remind ourselves that the two branches, the three branches of philosophy are ethics, metaphysics, and epistemology. This is traditionally, historically, how it's been divided up. Divisions in topics does not mean that they are necessarily divided in reality. This is a problem that the vegans were falling into, uh, which is a really kind of a basic philosophical error. The idea that because you can speak of something distinct, that they are, in fact, distinct in reality. Uh, I don't believe that. I don't think so. I think that <clears throat> if you've read my essay on the fact that uh, is epistemology, for example, presupposes ethics and metaphysics and vice versa, ethics presupposes metaphysics and epistemology, then you know that the school of thought that I come from, the worldview that I promote, sees all those things as integra integrally connected. Now, how do we know that? How do we show that? Well, I wrote a whole essay on it, which everybody can go read if they want to see the uh, fuller treatment of it, but quite simply, it should be obvious that these things are connected. For example, if I make a claim to to <clears throat> know that it, for, ex for example, I know that it is wrong to uh, kill someone, okay, that is, uh, or if I believe that it's wrong to kill someone, or I think that it is ethically, uh, uh, it's a violation of ethics to, to kill someone, that assumes that I have some knowledge, right, that it's wrong to do that. Uh, when we talk about killing someone, we're talking about actions that take place in the external world that immediately involves metaphysics. So in other words, uh, generally speaking, unless I believe that everything in my mind is a projection uh, uh, of, of some phantasm or if everything is a, a solipsistic sort of uh, surrealist world in my mind, then I assume that the people are, are other entities, right? They're, they're beings other than me unless I believe in Maya or I believe in surrealism, uh, those are other people who have dignity and rights, correct? And so, in other words, immediately you begin to see when you ask just a few questions about the assumptions <laughs> that go into talking about any ethical question or dilemma, you start to realize that they don't operate uh, apart from other branches of philosophy or other questions of philosophy. When I say I believe it's wrong to kill, uh, that assumes that I'm a subject, that I'm a person, that I'm a, a being who can choose, who wills this or that, who can commit actions in a world, right? in an external world that affects other beings. Again, unless I adopt some view that, you know, all of reality is just a simulation of my mind or something, right? Some, some bizarre far eastern view or something uh you know we tend to operate in th on the basis of the assumptions of western or christian metaphysics and philosophy even having divorced our worldviews from the theology a long time ago we still act like beings out there in the world are separate beings that have some sort of choice or dignity even though we might construct physical uh, metaphysical systems or uh uh anti-metaphysical systems where those beings have no rights, we still, in practice, continue to operate like they are, right? I mean, nobody consistently lives out a completely will-to-power, uh, you know, predatory social Darwinian worldview, unless you're like, you know, the top globalist or something. Most people don't <laughs> consistently, day-to-day, -day live that way, right? They act as if it's wrong for people to steal their money, to cheat them, right? Uh, it's not wrong, uh, you know, unless there's some force or truth behind ethical or metaphysical norms, if, unless there's some kind of absolutist wrong and right, unless there's some sort of uh, objectivity uh, in regard to knowledge claims, truth claims, et cetera, et cetera, right? So when we, when we understand that presuppositionalism uh, is not a shady word game, but in fact, a host of real philosophical questions that can be asked and should be asked, uh, we start to see how many things we assume. And this is kind of a basic point in philosophy. So the point I'm getting at with that is that when we look at the modern world, 
when we look at the anti-philosophical stance of much of the modern world, why so many of the, 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 peop- the purveyors of scientism actually just come out and say philosophy is worthless is precisely because of this issue. It's precisely because when we start to nail them on, on points, they have to resort to the denial of philosophy. But no, wait a minute. Logic is part of philosophy. It's absolutely part of philosophy. Nobody can deny this, right? Uh, and, and so the denial of philosophy just sort of out of hand, like we see with somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson, is so absurd that it denies the very things that he claims to have uh, full control of. Like he, right, the, the, the scientific crowd, the scientistic crowd, they alone are the purveyors of reason and logic. And yet they turn around and will talk about philosophy being worthless. Well, I'm sorry, but nobody can deny logic is a function of philosophy. So it really amounts to endless, countless absurdities when we start to ask very basic questions. And part of this is is due to the fact that people don't know philosophy. They're, they have not studied it. They have not read Plato. They've not read Kant. They've not read any of these major figures. They've not read Hume. They don't know the major debates, major discourses. They don't know the course of ideas in Western thought, how ideas lead to other ideas. And yes, they do. If you don't know that, they don't know any of this stuff. But they're more than willing to get in your face, lose their shit, and become unhinged with a little bit of philosophy. Right? There's nothing more dangerous than a 22-year-old who's had a little bit of philosophy let loose on YouTube. This is like the worst thing in the world. <laughs> and yes, uh, we, we can all uh, sympathize with this somewhat. I mean, I'm sure that at age 22, when I was taking my philosophy classes, I was completely insufferable. I'm sure. But maybe maybe not as bad as some of these guys. Because I was already a, a pretty committed, grounded uh, presuppositionalist and... Uh, proponent of transcendental argumentation at age 22. I think I first came into contact with this about age 20 or 21 was my first exposure to uh, to that school of thought. I read Van Til's Apologetic in toto. I bought it right away and I read all 800 pages right away at about age 20 or 21. And that was my introduction to uh, transcendental argumentation and thought. And uh, I was impressed. I was really taken with the the force of the argumentation, the force of the logic, uh, the power of the arguments, uh, the basically, nu- as Bonson once said, nuclear strength apologetics. Yeah, I think that's true. And that's because it, we have to always we have to always make these qualifications because people get get confused. It's not because Kant was the greatest thinker. Okay, so people who don't know these. The, this realm or, or this stuff, they hear this these terms and they mean, oh, you're talking about Kant. Okay, so Jay is a Kantian. No, 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 no. Now, transcendental arguments have a, a long, much longer heritage and pedigree than Immanuel Kant. As we pointed out, we see transcendental arguments in Aristotle, in the metaphysics against the sophist. Uh, as we pointed out in terms of orthodoxy, we see St. John Damascus and his fount of knowledge use a transcendental argument at the very beginning, echoing Aristotle. So transcendental arguments have had an interesting history that popped up here and there. Uh, we see inklings of it in certain apologetic approaches. I mean, the ontological argument is not a good argument, but it's a little more down the road of an a priori transcendental argument uh, for God than the so-called classical arguments. So there, there's been some interesting inklings of it here and there, but... And we might even look at um, Descartes' ontological argument. It's interesting, but it still is flawed. It's still not a full-fledged transcendental argument. Okay, so, <clears throat> but the reason we're talking about this is just to stress that, that in, in my mind, uh, philosophy has always been about asking questions. That's at least one big part of it, right? And the irony about modern scientism which is is so sort of shocking to me like an ultimate level double think here uh, 
is that science is grounded on the idea of asking questions. And yet they turn around and they will dogmatically tell you the questions that you cannot ask. Okay, so what they essentially mean is you can only ask questions within the paradigm or presuppositions of what I find acceptable questions to be. If you ask a question about the status of logic, if you ask a question about the uh, nature of concepts, if you ask a question about how is it that claims can be true over time, these kinds of philosophical questions, those are illegal questions. Those are retard questions. Those are the questions that are not allowed in so-called science. Why is that? Well, because science investigates the natural world, we're told. Well, that just assumes that the questions that I'm asking have nothing to do with the natural world. And I think that they do. In other words, they do not want any investigation of the scientific method itself in terms of how it functions in ter- via logic. And yes, the scientific method follows logical patterns and principles, whether they know it or not. They do not want questions revolving around the ethicality of science, generally speaking. They do not want questions involving the metaphysics of science and scientific methodology. And all of this you will learn when you take a philosophy of science class. You will be introduced to a host of questions that are assumed in the philosophic method of science or in the natural sciences, right? Now, they also are never aware, 99.9% of the time, they're not aware of powerful influences in the history of science and the natural sciences, the scientific method, royal society, right? I could count on my hand the number of times I've talked to academics or people from that world, I know of three off the top of my head, who are very familiar with the power that, for example, the Royal Society has had in, in, in influencing uh, the methodology of science throughout the world of academia. And this is why, for example, we had the, the Lancet, the fam- famous uh, magazine, uh, Medical Journal of Oxford, uh, a couple years ago, the editor of the Lancet put out a uh, startling admission in the journal. It's still public, by the way that half of the world's scientific peer-reviewed papers are fraudulent. Yes, you heard me right. Half of the world's scientific papers peer-reviewed are fraudulent. Well, that's pretty devastating to the assumptions of scientism, isn't it? And yes, they will go apeshit when you mention this. But now, wait a minute. This comes from the top of the scientific establishment, doesn't it? Let's see if I can pull it up. Um, Half of scientific papers are frauds. Uh, Yeah, I think I've got it right here. Now, the Lancet is, of course, the world's premier science journal. And guess what? You're going to notice something here in this uh, little beautiful admission here. You're going to see something to do with the Royal Society, aren't you? You're going to see something to do with what's called Chatham House Rules. What? Chatham House Rules? What would that have to do with science? Well, it has nothing to do with science because science is a purely neutral framework, isn't it? And I will, I'm going to go ahead right now and put the link to this, because this is very important, and not many people know about this. Now, I talked about it endlessly. Notice there's your Chatham House rules picture there. You don't know what Chatham House is. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't even need to be trying to debate me. It's very difficult to get this paper, this journal here, like, to fit on this screen. The case against science is straightforward. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. (laughs) Now, by the way, there's countless uh, studies and people have done countless uh, test cases where they get gibberish published in peer review, where they have papers written by AI that that are nonsense and get published in peer review. Uh, this, there have been multiple examples of this. 
uh, let me add this while I'm doing it. All right. So here in the in the uh, show description, I'm going to have this just right now at the very top. This is from the Lancet. Uh, and again, I can't fit the whole thing on the screen because it's like a journal thing. And this is by the editor of the Lancet. So again, one of the top medical journals, most prestigious in the world. And the very beginning of it says a lot of what is published is incorrect. I'm not allowed to say who made this remark because we are asked to observe Chatham house rules. What is this doing in a scientific journal? What? I thought we had academic freedom to ask any questions that we wanted. I thought, I thought science told us how the world works. And yet here at this top prestigious academic medical scientific journal from Oxford, uh, He's not allowed to say what's going on because of Chatham House rules. Well, guess what? Jason Alsis knows what's going on because we've been telling you about it for years. I've been telling you about the Royal Society and its scientific scammery and how they have promoted Darwinism for the last several centuries by design because they have a definite agenda and worldview, which is to dehumanize you and to kill you. They are all committed. That's Chatham House rules, right? Don't tell the truth to the slaves that are destined to be killed. And again, who else has done Tragedy and Hope? I'm telling you this. Who else has done the, tra- the same people that run the, the system in Tragedy and Hope, the Anglo-American establishment, right? It's the people at the top of the Royal Society. They're the same people. It's the same groups, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, the CFR, right? The Rockefellers, the Rothschilds. It's the same people. They write journals Their top journals tell you science is fraudulent. And what do you do? You believe it because you believe in the fallacy of authority. So much for logic. Now, I'm not saying this means that all science is false. Of course not. That would be retarded. I'm not saying this means that scientists don't make discoveries. I'm saying it's very naive to assume that you know how science works. By the way, I'm published in peer review. I have a peer review published paper. So I know how this work process works. Um, it's not a scientific paper. It's in an economic journal, but it is nevertheless peer review. So <laughs> the, the people who naively act like the way that this happens is just everybody being neutral. And then they just, you just, whoever's got the best arguments and whoever's got the best data and research, they just put their, time in and they put their paper in and if, if you've got the goods you're going to get published is utterly retarded what could be more naive than this have you ever actually been in academia have you been in the grad world i have <laughs> it doesn't work like that you want to know how it really works it's run by cliques of extreme leftists extreme ideologues extreme feminists extreme weirdos creepers quite literally all over academia just freaking degenerates they are in cliques. They're in secret societies. They're in their own little networks. Many of them are bought and paid for by big foundations and even the CIA. They know that it's a racket. Again, the whole university system is a giant tax and debt racket. So why do you think they're all going to be telling you the truth? They're not. They're liars. And the way academia works is that People aren't interested in truth. They are interested in making a name for themselves in academia to get funding. That's number one. And the way that you do that is that you have to come up with interesting, weird theories. You have to come up with uh, Shakespeare was actually a tranny. Let me give you the most technical analysis trying to prove something completely retarded. And because it fits in with the overall agenda, you get shot up the ladder. That's how academia works, right? When you publish your your paper proving Shakespeare was a tranny. That's academia, dum-dums. It's not this noble pursuit of truth and virtue. Far from it. Read Kuhn, right? Structures of Scientific Revolution. Scientific revolutions don't come because everybody's nobly seeking the truth. Scientific revolutions come because Somebody puts out something true and the entire establishment attacks it because they don't want to be wrong. That's why. 
Now, if you have not heard all the old shows that I did with Hoaxbusters, you can go back and listen to all those because we covered this ad nauseum. I'm not going to rehash two years worth of podcasts discussing scientism when you can go listen to all those where we endlessly cover the many, many, many examples of scientific peer review being fraudulent, scientific peer review being busted as fraudulent, on a mass scale. Did you hear me? A mass scale of scientific research being fraudulent. And I can tell you from personal example that my mom was an editor for science journals for the biggest publisher in America at one time. I know how this works. And all these dum-dums that try to talk about it, they don't even know that scientific publishing is private. Do you think that billionaire companies might have a say in what gets, gets published in scientific journals? Of course they do. It would be naive and stupid to think that they don't. But how many of these naive scientism promoters have ever even talked about this? They don't know who Reed Elsevier is. They don't know that Reed Elsevier publishes the biggest science journals in America and that they're a private billion dollar company. They don't know what Harcourt Brace Jovanovich was in the 80s. They don't know about Harcourt Publishing. They don't know about the fact that Harcourt owned SeaWorld. Now you say, why does that matter? Well, because that shows you that the, the entities that are publishing the biggest science journals in the world are private entities that buy theme parks. So they're for profit. <laughs> they're, not, they're not noble pursuers of truth, dummies. Right. So again, naivety, idiocy, people don't know what they're talking about. And people don't make connections across disciplines. This is another problem with education, right? So one of the reasons that we, that philosophy has been discarded is that guess what? Philosophy teaches you to make connections. Philosophy teaches you to think about the relationship between one thing and another thing (laughs) and their connections. And the entirety of modern education is built on Tearing down distinctions, excuse me, tearing down these relationships. So, for example, uh, we all know, hopefully, we're familiar with the idea of the Prussian education model and the idea of extreme compartmentalization. It was not accidental that that's the educational model that the West accepted and adopted because the goal was to create socialized individuals, not educated individuals. And all you have to do is read John Dewey, Horace Mann, and all the founders of American education, public education. They talk about that. They talk about creating the socialized idiot individual, not the thinker, not the philosopher, not the person who makes connections, the person who only sticks to some minutia, some stupid detail, worthless thing, publishing your paper about the the length of uh, uh, Shakespeare's strap on that he wore as a tranny. That's all you're supposed to know about in your, in your academic. I'm not joking, by the way, you think that's, that's literally what the academics study. They will study their lives into proving Shakespeare was a tranny and how long the dong was. It is that retarded. I am not exaggerating. I am not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. I'm telling you it's that retarded. I was there. That's what academia is. Okay. Now you say, well, wait a minute, Jay. This sounds like you're saying you're an obscurantist. Science doesn't exist. No, no, no. Real science doesn't happen in those areas. Real science happens in engineering. Real science happens in computer science. Real science happens in disciplines that actually have to apply the theory to the real world. Uh, It doesn't happen in biology class or astronomy class. Okay. Those are propaganda classes. Uh, But people that do engineering, they do real hard science, absolutely, all the time. And that's who develops things. That's why Lockheed, Martin, Raytheon, and Boeing don't call up Richard Dawkins. They don't call up uh, uh, JF uh, to figure out uh, how to advance their their technology. No, they call up people from engineering. Okay. I'm not saying that JF's not a smart guy. I'm not dissing JF. I'm just making the point that biology, life sciences, et cetera, et cetera, unless you're working in like biometrics, and stuff like that. Okay, you're not you're not uh, advancing the the cause of so-called applied science. Generally speaking, generally speaking, okay. And again, I'm not saying this is true for every single biologist. I'm just saying that this is the way the system works in terms of academia. Uh, of sure, plenty of biologists, plenty of paleontologists. They go and they study things and they make discoveries. And again, we already talked about this at the beginning. You can make discoveries and be correct about things. 
within your niche and still have the wrong paradigm. Your, your whole worldview can be wrong and you still make discoveries. The fact that you make correct discoveries does not prove that your whole worldview or paradigm is correct. And that's true. Uh, I think I would say that's self-evident. It's obviously true because even the atheist, again, will admit that there are plenty of theists in mathematics, plenty of theists in engineering who make discoveries and advances. And they believe that those people are wrong in their paradigms of theism, and yet they still make advances. Likewise, atheists can make advances. Atheists can make discoveries. Sure. Absolutely. That does not prove their paradigm. Now, Uh, we got a couple of super chats here before I continue going on. Alex Parker, or Alex Parrer, you make me want to be a better man. Well, good. Hopefully, that's uh, that's what we're here to to promote. Uh, not in the Masonic sense, right? Freemasonry says they make good men better. That's not what we're here to do. Uh, we want to make men into gods. Okay, so theosis is what we're talking about here, not some uh, gay Freemasonic thing. But thank you, Alex. Justin Stam, $10. Thank you for going through the explanation of salvations of the Jews. Obviously, it isn't from the Jews themselves, but what was given to them from God. No, of course. I mean, I don't think anybody was trying to say that uh, there's some sort of mystical power to Judaism itself or to the biology or DNA. Uh, and this is sort of the mysticism of later Talmudism that says that. And uh, the prophets, of course, rebuke that, that uh, idea many times over. David Singh, $5. Van Til's Apologetic, you mentioned. Can you link it? Yeah, it's called Van Til's Apologetic uh, by Greg Bonson. Um, not the most accessible book, though. Uh, this is a, a, a difficult text. Um, you know, it's not going to be easy reading unless you have a pretty, a fairly, unless you're fairly fluent in philosophy, you're not going to be able to read the book. And I'm not trying to be mean, but... I mean, it's a very long, very technical book. Um, there's other easier books that could be could be accessible. Um, Bonson has a um, uh, what's his uh, Let me find his other book real quick here that's uh, more accessible. Actually, the guy who uh, Jason, Doctor Lyle, who I, I do think is pretty good. Actually, he has a really good introduction to to this. So, uh, if you want an easy introduction, uh, you know, unless you have like a master's degree in philosophy, uh, you're not going to be able to read Bentil's Apologetic. Um, I'm going to put it right here, real quick, underneath the PDF of The Lancet. So, there's one Bonson book. Um, I will add Bentil's Apologetic here but you're not going to be able to read it unless you are advanced in philosophy. You're going to find it very difficult. I'm not saying you can't do it. If you want to do it, go for it. Uh, and let's see, what's that? Uh, what's that Jason Lyle book? Is it, I think it's ultimate proof for creation. Is that it? He's got an introduction to, to transcendental arguments is, that's pretty good. I think it's this one, so I'll put it down below. Okay, so all those books, by the way, have been added there to the uh, to the link in the description. Um, and yeah, they're Protestants, so they get some things wrong, but um, For an orthodox approach to presuppositionalism, I'm going to add this book as well by Father Schuping, which is called uh, Irenaeus and Orthodox Apologetic Myth Methodology, where we can correct the errors of the Calvinists uh, via this book. Damn it. Here we go. 